Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. What a wonderful morning we had with worship, uh, sharing of the word through the Psalms, and we are now uh, entering uh, a scripture portion that I would like to, all of us to turn our attention to, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, we'll be looking at the whole letter, if possible, but of course the time is limited, but just looking at the background uh, would help us understand this particular theme and the passage that we will be looking at today. The theme that we will be looking at today is imitating Christ with confidence and joy in the light of kenosis. I'll repeat that. Imitating Christ with confidence and joy in the light of kenosis. Some weighty terms there, but don't worry, we'll be getting into that word kenosis very soon. But uh, let, let's just deep, uh, dig right in into this particular letter that Paul has written to the church at Philippi. Starting from the verse first, we will look the first chapter and the first verse, we will see uh, some of the questions that I have placed here that is important for us to understand the background. Uh, beginning with four questions will help us understand the background of this episode. The four questions would be like, who wrote it? To whom it is written? From where was it written? And why was it written? The first question, who wrote it? Quite simple. Paul has written uh, this letter. He says, I, the servant or doulos or slave, has written this letter to the church, the holy ones. He doesn't use the word church. He doesn't use believers. He used the word holy ones at Philippi, something that we can keep in mind when we move forward, calls himself slave and calls the church at Philippi the holy ones. Then uh, just digging a little bit, uh, taking a small pause into to whom it was written, a few things I would like us to keep in our mind, in our background when we move forward would be that when, when Paul went to uh, Macedonia. He got this vision that he needs to go to Macedonia. He made a quick stop even at Philippi, which was a prominent city. In fact, Philip uh, was the father of uh, Alexander the Great, and Philippi was named after him. And that region was also called as a mini Rome. So it was quite central, quite important uh, a city. When Paul went there, we will look in Acts, but not right now. We can look at it later. Uh, uh, when we go home, that when Paul went there, he, you would see that he could not find synagogues. That was his usual way of preaching the gospel when he is going to a new place. The first thing he does is first goes to the Jews over there, and then he goes to the Gentiles. But when Philippi is peculiar about that, where he could not find believers because of this particular area that is predominantly Gentile culture. It was predominantly consisting of Romans, the, the veterans of the Roman and the Greek uh, soldiers. And we'll also see that this was the first church that Paul established in the whole of Europe. This was a generous and a giving church. You can look at that in chapter 4 of verse 15. But it says, as you know, you Philippians were the ones who gave me financial help when I brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. So he would oftentimes mention this, that the, the church is a giving church. It's a generous church, sacrificially giving. And he also would also say that this is a suffering church. And quite a few, the whole theme of this Episode would show that, that they are sharing in the suffering with Paul. So we already said who wrote it. We already know to who it is being written. A church that is generous, a church that is consisting of uh, Gentile believers predominantly, and also that it, is a, it was a suffering church just like Paul is. From where is this written is our third question. The third question would answer he's writing it from the prison, or you can call it house arrest. That again you can read in uh, Acts where Paul writes it's believed that he wrote four letters and one of them is Philippians. Did you know that the canonical Bible 
uh, that we have is not written or is not combined together according to chronology, but according to the length of episodes. So it starts with the length of episodes. So it does not mean Philippians was written way after Ephesians and all that. Uh, so Philippians was written while he was in house arrest, which we can see he's going through trials. Uh, he's been traveling. He's been shipwrecked. He's been persecuted, stoned, uh, beaten up accused by his own brethren, by his own friends, and we also see he is bitten by snakes, and then we also see now he is in prison. And he says, you are sharing this with me uh, in my prison. And if you look at 1 verse 14, and because of my imprisonment, and also he says again uh, in verse 7, so it is right that I should feel so about you, or all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me a special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and defending, confirming the truth of the good news. And we will see time and again, Paul does mention that they are also suffering. So it's a suffering church, it's a generous church. Paul himself is in prison and he is able to sympathize with them. Which is quite important because when we read, uh, let's say... Uh, When we read the words, uh, the, the fourth question would tell us that when we read this epistle and we understand Paul is coming from the same or much more intense situation of house arrest, pain, and struggle, that why is he writing this? And the first point under why, there will be four more sub things that I will be focusing on under that question, why he wrote this letter and which is quite important, and we will see the first thing I am going to uh, ponder on is the encouragement in suffering that Paul is trying to say here. He is asking the church to be joyful, and that theme is also predominant in this episode, to be joyful, and that's how we have this, this song that we sang when we were, I didn't go much to Sunday school, which is true, uh, but one of the songs that I still remember is Rejoice in the Lord Always, and again I say rejoice. These themes of rejoice and joy is always going to be an overarching theme in the whole episode. And that is the encouragement Paul is giving. And not just that, Paul is able to say that you and I are in this together. So this is an epistle of joy. Some people call this an epistle of joy, even though Paul, even though the church is going through struggles. There's quite something out there that we need to learn from that epistle, that even though the church is going through all that struggle personally, in a communi communal way and in a national way. But still, he's in the contrary, in a very contrast way saying that rejoice. And this is also called the epistle of joy. If you want to look at it, it's in verse 1, verse 30, where he says that it's going to be okay. We are in this together. So true friendships is what I want to also look at while we are looking at it. That true friendships can double the joy and half the pain. We can relate with people who are going through similar situations. We can relate with people who are struggling. And that gives us credibility, just like Paul is given credibility when he's talking to this through the letter to the church of Philippi. And then, so why is he writing this? First, he's writing it to encourage those believers. Second, why is he writing this? To address disagreements within the church. There is some sort of disunity in the church. If you look at 4 verse 1, 2 verse 2, 2 verses 19, Again, you would see that there is disagreements and disunity in the church, which is not unusual, even in today's churches, right? But what is Paul encouraging? He's addressing that in this letter. But I will not focus on that just because the theme passage is what we are heading towards. Then the third thing what he is doing is warning them. What is he doing? He's warning them. He's warning them against the enemies of the cross. Why is he calling them enemies of the cross? That is a very important question here. Why Paul is calling these people enemies of the cross? It's because of their conduct. It is because of their teaching. A teaching can lead a person astray, and God, Jesus himself, says that such a people is worse. And here Paul says they risk, they are a risk to Gentile believers. They're, they are mutilators of the flesh. Verse 3, verse 2. And then 3, verse 19. Their own appetite was their God. They brag about shameful things. 
Their thinking is limited to, limited to earthly things. And these are the people who are leading this church sometimes. Looking at YouTube, you would see a lot that we can see that not just us, but even the Gentile people in our, country, in our world, those who don't believe in Christ can see. The flamboyance of the preachers, the flamboyance of the churches is sometimes even a stumbling block because they are not fit to lead like that. I was reading the Bible at uh, my workplace one time, and uh, it was my downtime, of course, and uh, I had some spare time. And then uh, a colleague walks into my office and he says, what are you reading? I was like, I'm reading the Bible. He's like, okay, uh, I, I put that away a long time ago and it has done me good. I was like, okay, let's talk about it. And then it was pretty interesting conversation how he brings up that Christians that he knows of is living a flamboyant life that is contrary to what Bible teaches. He is teaching about, he's saying, those who take this pulpit love to say the things that they say, but don't like to, he says, they love to say, do what I say, but don't do what I do. And I, I was astounded. This guy knows what he's talking about. It is not hidden from anybody. It is, it's wide open. It's social media, right? But here, Paul is saying is warning against such people. These are the mutilators of the flesh. They are thinking, their thinking is limited to earthly things and we are not bound by these earthly things. Our, our warning should come within that are we one of those while we are meditating on this. And then finally, I would like to come to the challenge to imitate Christ. This warning that I said just before has a reason why I mentioned who it is written to. Because these people were focusing on something that Christ is not preaching. Christ is not saying that you have to do anything to earn the salvation that I gave freely to you. They were emphasizing on circumcision, which is a bodily thing. And if you don't do that, you cannot be saved, which was clearly wrong. So there are no works that can satisfy the salvation that was given to us freely. But Paul also says, bear fruits of your salvation. In Philippians 3 verses 3 and 9, Paul is very clear about how we receive the gift of salvation. It is a gift freely given to us. There's nothing I can or you can do to receive that. It is freely available to anyone. We become righteous by faith alone. But when he talks about the fruits of salvation, it's a challenge for us. In 2 verse 2, uh, we will see how he is talking about it. Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Then if we go on to verse 2 verse uh, 12, work hard to show the results of your salvation. I'll repeat, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire to do what pleases him. Very contrasting. Sam, you said we have to do no work to receive salvation. Then you're also saying there is work involved. Yes, there is work involved only to reflect what we have received. It is like a reciprocity or like what is worship? It is a response to what God has already done. Our life is a living worship as a response to what God has redeemed us for. And then we will also see He wants us to work hard to display the fruits of salvation. Let's turn our attention to also 1 Timothy verses 1, uh, 1 Timothy 4 verses 7, 8, and 12. I'll, I'll help read that. See you, so you see, faith itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. That's, sorry, James chapter 2 verse 17. It is dead and useless. First Timothy verse four, uh, 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. See, that is the work 
that Paul wants us to be conscious of. That you are called to reflect what Jesus has done for you. I would like to move on by this one joyful note from that challenge. That if you read that verse again, two, uh, chapter 2 of Philippians, the second half of when he's asking us to do this, he's saying, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Not to do what pleases me, to do what pleases him. But how is it being done? By allowing God to do that work inside of me. Yet again, a lot of that burden is taken away by just letting God to work through us. He's enabling us. And again, you will see in chapter 1, verse 9, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding pretty important to stay away from those mutilators of the flesh. And then I say, I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced by who? By Jesus Christ. So again, a lot of that burden, a lot of that task has been again given back to who? To Jesus. So we are saved by grace, by his gift. But again, when we want to live that grace, when we want to live that salvation, yet again, we just have to allow him to work inside us. That is a sweet note that I want to leave that challenge with. Now, coming to the key, key passage for kenosis of Christology. I have eight minutes ahead of you, therefore I will rush into this. Uh, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11 is what I would like to read uh, and also contrast this what these days we see Christians follow as Christmas. Let's pay attention to chapter 2, verses 5, verse 11. This is our key passage. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Say with me, attitude. Attitude. Whose attitude Christ Jesus had? Though he was God, he did not think equality with God. So we are already beginning with who Jesus is. He is God. There should be no doubt about that. He did not hold on to the privileges so there are theologians who would argue about what did Jesus lose or what did he give up when he was coming down to this earth. If I expound on that and try to explain, weeks can take. But just I will summarize to what our belief is or my belief is that God cannot change. God cannot change. When he came to earth is his first miracle for us on this earth. He did not start with Cana according to me, but it started even Jesus' birth. The unnatural virgin birth was the first miracle that Jesus performed. And then it doesn't, we cannot fathom it. How is it possible? How he was able to, being God from eternity, constrain himself in human flesh. He took on the form of the human. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience, very important word, obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross, which was equal to 1,000 deaths, according to some people. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. We began God as Jesus. Jesus as God. And then we end this passage, Jesus as our Lord. So he technically has always been God. He only took on the flesh, but does not mean he gave up his divinity. He was always God, 100% God and 100% man. Why I emphasize on this is because some theologians would also argue that God gave away some of his omnipotence, some of his omniscience, some of his every other attributes that God should be having. But God is an unchangeable God. He is an immutable God. Therefore, that is my stance and that should be our stance. Now let's compare that slave attitude of Christ to the attitude of Christians that display Christmas in our time. I would like to quote what Paul, John MacArthur in one of his sermons in 2009, Theology of Christmas, Christmas had to say. To put it mildly, 
Christmas is a little bit confusing to the watching world. I'm pretty sure uh, I'm not able to get over it. Year after year, I'm struck by the paradoxes of Christmas, the strange juxtaposition of Christianity and a kind of carnival mentality. The humility and poverty of the stable confused with the wealth and indulgence of selfishness and gift giving. The quietness of Bethlehem with the din of the shopping mall. The seriousness of the incarnation with the silliness of the party spirit and the party attitude. The blinking color lights just, just topoxed with the star of heaven. Just a confusion designed certainly by the enemies of men's soul. That's very weighty to... I hope we are able to understand what Paul, uh, John was able to say there in the few sentences. Contrast that with the kenosis, the emptying of Jesus Christ, coming down on human as, uh, coming down to earth as human. His emptiness depicts his slave attitude, depicts his servant leadership. But the Christmas that the world sees, or we have adopted, is quite contrary. So let us be mindful as we enter this, the season of Christmas, as we are entering, to be mindful of the kenosis of Christology. I would also take help from a couple of uh, theologians to understand why I take the stance that God did not stop being God or stop having those powers. Karl Barth says, God is always God even in his humiliation. He humbled himself, but he did not do it by ceasing to be who he is. Another theologian, Tokenbo Ariemo, uh, he said, in accepting humility or humiliation, Christ held nothing back. He held nothing back. He made himself nothing. Or the NRSV translation of emptying himself. This does not mean that he divested himself of such divine attributes as omniscience, omnipotence, or omnipresence. For he could still say, I and the Father are one. The nothing focuses on status rather than his essence. It means that he completely abandoned all the rights and privileges to which he was entitled. So when a rich man becomes poor, he is still the same person by essence or nature. Only his manner of existence. We can't attempt to be bogged down by the sense of how did God become human? But let us focus on why he become human. We can watch an excellent sermon, Pastor John Verghese, who on October 13 was able to say about the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. By that sacrifice, why he came down is to make us priests of uh, kings and priests on this earth. If there is anything we can take away, he gave us this salvation free of cost. This gift is our joy and confidence. But do not bury this gift that was given to you in the ground like the lazy servant did. As a result of the salvation, we work hard to, to show the fruits of our salvation by allowing him to work in us. We certainly can do good works by our own efforts. Jesus could have done a lot of things. In fact, anything he wanted by his own merit, by his own will. But he always chose to depend on God. If we want to look at that, John chapter 1 verses 1 is going to help us understand a little bit. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Let us turn that attention to once again John chapter 1 verses 1. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. So everything that we know of, everything, everything in this universe and the universes that we don't know of, everything was created through who? Through Jesus Christ. Let us also read John chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. John chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. Don't believe me, Jesus is saying this, don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. If I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done. He does not say God has done, but I have done. So this attitude of God the Father from the beginning doing things through Jesus Christ is not for the first time in the incarnation. He has been having this obedient attitude from the beginning. It was an attitude that he did not just do it on the cross, but it was a daily practice for Jesus. From the beginning, God has been working 
through Jesus Christ. He has been there in everything. And this shows the unity between Jesus and the Father. And that is the challenge Paul is giving through this letter to the church where there was disunity. You have to humble ourselves just like Jesus did to be one with the Father, to be one with each other, to humble each other, ourselves to each other, to be in agreement with each other, to show the fruits of our salvation in love and in care. And that shows how Jesus is the example for us. Church, if there are people who have been disappointed by some people around us, or even by me, if I have disappointed people, I am not your example. Jesus is the example. We are all imitating our, our Jesus. We are all supposed to imitate our Jesus. And with that challenge, I would like to conclude my sermon. Thank you for paying attention. God bless you all.